and welcome to Talking Events, the event industry podcast brought to you by Event Industry News, being recorded today from the Ticket Script offices um, in the heart of London's um, Silicon uh, Roundabout District, I think they call it. Um, great for them to host. Uh, thanks to the guys at Ticket Script for letting us set up our Talking Events studio and, and talk events for the day. Um, we welcome into the studio for the first time two new guests, Alistair Turner from 8PR. Alistair, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Richard Cadry langford from Lime Venue Portfolio. Richard, welcome along to Talking Events. Nice to meet you. And we're going to be looking today uh, and talking about the continuing trend in the events industry of a move to experience. Let's throw it straight over to you guys. Um, Alice or Richard, what, what do we mean by a, a move to experience and that being a trend? Yeah, this is, this is something that, that that's grown in the events industry over a, a steep period of time, which is essentially the events industry growing up and seeing itself as more than just the people that lay out the chairs, lay out the drinks, but actually part of the creative community where we create amazing experiences that resonate, that affect business, um, that affect people, uh, that bring people together and make for a better industry. Um, and what we're trying to move our language on so that we're not just talking about events, but talking about the curation of experiences and understanding that that brings value to the, uh, the overall industry. And it's actually a more compelling reason why businesses will want to do events rather than just straight experiences. Uh, uh, Richard, by, by the very nature of it, going to an event is an experience of some description. Yep. Really, what are, are we talking about making them, making them a better experience than they were previously? Exactly that, yeah. I mean, I think what we kind of try and say is that if you're going to host an event, whatever the kind of event is, whether it's a, a meeting or a conference or a banquet, that you should make it the best it can be. Sure. And you need to think about it in all levels of, of, of the organisation of the event to make sure that that is the case. How does how does making them better events actually manifest themselves? You know, do, when we're talking about the specifics of, of how to improve the experience that people are having, wh what are we looking at here and what's been identified as a specific element? Yeah, uh, you know, f f for us when we talk about, you know, curating events, it's about sitting there and starting at the content. I think what the events industry had historically been known as is a functional operational thing, which is I want to say something, how do I do it? Rather, what we're trying to do in terms of the events industry is start with the content of the event and then create an experience around that. So in the same way as one would have an amazing experience at an art gallery or a museum, what we're trying to do is sit there and think, okay, someone's gonna walk into this room that we're creating for them. How are they gonna feel? What are they gonna see? Um, how do we want them to think as they enter, as they leave? Um, what are they gonna feel, touch? What are we gonna tell them? How are we gonna tell them in a way that makes them remember it or that resonates with them? And how are we gonna produce that um, that experience for them that, that, that makes it hit harder rather than just where they're going to sit, what they're going to do, what they're going to eat, that sort of thing. Well, well, and we've, we've spoken to venues in, in, in uh, previous episodes of, of the podcast before about how they've, they've worked hard to adapt themselves as venues to mm. make them more applicable to what is required of a modern event organiser. Um, how would you actually, how have you approached that, Richard, in terms of, uh, of changing uh, the, the, the venues um, and, and adapting as an operator what can be offered towards an event organiser? Uh, I think for the main part, it's about actually treating the meetings and events um, as a serious operation. So making sure that the people that we're running the events for us are passionate about the meetings and events they're operating. Uh, and that's coming from our chefs uh, to the operation teams and then our sales teams as well. So they're actually kind of really knowing their venue through and through so that actually when someone comes in, they can engage them properly, show them the best way to utilise that venue for their event. Sorry, Alistair. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I would add, I think, I think Lime Venue Portfolio is very lucky because they... They, they represent purely unique venues. Sure, yeah. So, so what, what... Well, give we us a flavour of some of those. What, what, what sort of venues are we talking about here? Well, so we're looking at anything from sporting venues, such as uh, the Royal Barch Conference Centre, uh, to the Keir Oval Twickenham, um, to large conference centres, Olympia and, Com uh, and Excel are part of our portfolio, uh, but also really kind of unique historic venues as well, such as Hatfield House, sure. um, yeah, yeah. Dartmouth House, even castles like... Leeds Castle and Hever Castle as well. So really, a, a quite 
a broad spectrum there as well, aren't we? We're, we're, we're yeah. able to cater for, for, for a lot of different requirements. And, and, and what, what, what I think this means for the industry is when someone chooses one of these um, very, very special and unusual venues, they're already thinking about their meeting in a very different way. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about that experience in a very different way. Um, if you walk into a, a, a blank, empty, um, you know, very, very stale room, um, it says a message. If you walk into a magnificent historical um, venue or a sporting stadium, it sends a very, very clear message as well. And what it does is it shows that that particular event organizer is thinking about their event in a very specific way, um, on a more creative level, on a more experience-led level, um, which is why you know, to be fair, the guys at Line Venue Portfolio are probably seeing this trend a sure, lot more yeah. than some of the other event uh, uh, you know, industry but is. For me, it's about making the event memorable. If you leave a venue after an event and forget why you were there, why you'd been there, anything you saw, tasted, felt, um, then what was the point? So the more you can bring in things that create memorable events, such as unique locations, such as fantastic food, great production, all those kind of key things. That e everything needs to be considered, I think. Um, the more you can do that, the more memorable that event will be and the more successful your return on you know your objectives will be. So, so, we're, so we're talking about, uh, and again, this is the subject that's, that's cropped up very recently um, when it comes to venues, is, is this move away from blank canvas. And blank canvas can be great, but where there's an, a requirement for an organiser to really come in with and come up with everything themselves in terms of production elements, in terms of staffing, in terms of catering, whatever it may be. Um, there's this sort of shift now towards a consultative approach to um, event planning with a venue and with an organiser and the venue actually being able to supply a lot more than perhaps they used to in the past. Um, is that something that you, you, you've seen within the portfolio of, uh, of venues, Alistair, and, and an it's, increase in offering? It's, it's, you know, from a wider perspective, from an industry-wide perspective, what we, what we know is that this unusual venue sector is adding incremental growth to mm -hmm. the industry. The, 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 the premise being that people that would not have had events before are now able to have the events that they want because there's a venue that suits them better. So the blank canvas thing is absolutely right, and I think that's an important part of curating events. But actually, the first thing that's on the list is actually what sort of environment do I want to create? Mm. It may be that that environment already exists, or they didn't even know that they wanted it to exist until they found out that it was on sale. Sure, and what yeah. we have is this very, very dynamic and agile sector of the events industry that's very, very quickly growing up, that's establishing itself, that is producing high quality. It's a genuine option, and which means they can do that event. That I think that's a really good point in terms of being a genuine option, which is that before people would potentially choose a unique venue or unusual venue and have slight reservations mm -hmm. so maybe they're going out on a limb now people are choosing our venues because we deliver great events that's the view that we're getting we, they have complete trust in what we're doing and the fact that it's an unusual venue is now an added value uh, an added benefit but as Ali was saying now they're actually thinking okay how can we make our events better how can we think about this better um, and that's why they're then coming for looking for an unusual venue. So the venues themselves develop, developing a reputation for being able to stage quality venues within a unique setting Definitely. rather than perhaps, you know, 15, 20 years ago, booking a unique venue, but then thinking, oh, crikey, how on earth are we actually going to deliver a, a decent event even though we've got this fabulous venue? Um, so shift away. And what, and what I'm curious about, the, the, the change appears to have been with the certainly the non-creative side of the events industry so people who work for organizations who maybe not necessarily have a uh, a background in creating events so not just the creative agencies that we used to associate with delivering the events but the actual you know the management of companies and staff within yeah. companies themselves actually mm. driving events because they have a better understanding of it and, and you know what and i think that is a really really important uh, point because we have people in this industry that wake up in the morning and they organize events and they get it and they know where it's going and they're at the front of all of this happening but we've all got we've also got customers that come out there and they wake up in the morning and they're a PA or an EA or they're a managing director or a CEO and they're asked to organize a company conference or a company party or a training scheme and things like that 
they're the guys that actually we're seeing and now understanding this as well and putting even more value in there. So if you take something like a, the classic company conference, mm. whereas it used to be, a, you know, the, the person organizing would go, okay, I need a venue. Oh, there's a conference center. I'm doing a conference. I'll go to a conference center. That's not happening so much now. And we're seeing a genuine shift where they're saying, they're actually, the first question they're, they're asking themselves is, okay, how am I gonna create this experience? What am I gonna do that's gonna make that conference send a real clear message? How am I gonna get the most out of that event? How am I gonna send a real statement from it? And that's the, the, these are the guys that are really exciting us because they're the ones turning to unusual venues and looking at things like the food and the drink and, and, and really, really um, at, at the edge of this, this curation of great events and experiences, you know? Meetings mean business. When I say that to you, what 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 what, uh, what does that phrase um, mean? Okay, so it's basically about saying, whatever meeting you organise, make sure that it has a clear focus. Make sure that that it, that it's arranged in such a way that you're going to maximise your business. So it's not business interruption; it's it's business itself. Um, you're not just going there. You know, the last thing we want is for anyone to come away from an event saying, sorry, a, a, a meeting saying why did I go there today? I've spent two hours on the train and I've, I've been in that meeting we could have done on that conference call. That's not a good meeting. Those meetings need to be cut out. The meetings that we're advocating are ones that have a clear focus, a clear objective, and that achieve that at the end of the day. Uh, and meetings bus mean business is about encouraging people to deliver those kind of meetings and providing some information around how they can do that as well with some kind of advice, guidance, and those kind of things. And, and, and I suppose much of this is driven by the fact that we, we could generate a PowerPoint presentation and deliver that online now to an audience of thousands of people without getting those people in. There's no requirement anymore to put people in a room to show them a PowerPoint, is there? And, and it might have taken people a while to wake up to this fact, but essentially what we're saying is that we're seeing more and more, more people waking up to the fact that, hold on, this is not the best use of our time or resources to have an event, but then do something that we could effectively do remotely. Mm. Yeah, and, definitely. And, and, and I think, W what I like about the meetings being business campaign is that they're encouraging that meeting. They're encouraging the meeting that actually decides that it has to meet, that decisions need to be made or communication needs to be strong and resonating and things like that. And, and, and what they're doing is this is a campaign that's actually rewarding that and actually, by the way, incentivizing that as well. Mm. And I think it's really, really good that the, 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 the business like Lime Bandit Portfolios is out there, not, not only just saying, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're right behind it, but actually saying, right, okay, what are the steps that we can make to kind of encourage this more, mm -hmm. um, and that's what it, it's it's a, it's a nice statement for the industry. It's nice. Uh, I think you know, event organisers out there would be quite nice to know that a company like that has their back. I'd always like to reinforce the argument that I kind of made before with regards to making events memorable. And obviously, it's an easy word to say, but I know myself personally. I've been on webinars and things like this, whereby yeah, you might sign up for it. You might be on that for an hour, so you're not having the kind of the disruption ar around it. But you don't remember what you saw. You you you, know, you, 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 you finish the conversation or, or the webinar, you move on, and then the, the event's forgotten. Uh, so maybe the learning that you're getting from there isn't quite right. Whereas, if the meeting's done well and it's done properly, um, and you're engaged with it, you know you've gone to a venue whereby you're excited about going. I remember mm. uh, I went to Bristol Zoo uh, for a small for a small meeting uh, on Tuesday, I think, um, and the lions were roaring as I arrived and, and I posted it on Facebook because it's like quite a cool thing to do you know there's lions roaring at my it was the last time meeting. you went for a meeting in a zoo <laughs> <laughs> exactly but it was a really well formulated meeting we knew exactly what we were there to do and we got some really good action points out of it and everyone came away feeling kind of invigorated so it was a small meeting but it was an important one Alistair you mentioned that the um, the industry is growing up are you on just about the UK industry? Have you had experience of looking at it on a, on a wider basis, either European or US or, or global? Is the industry as a whole growing up? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as, as well as uh, being manager, at the director of APR and marketing, I'm also um, sit on the board for the International Special Events Society, and we look at the global industry. Now, I'm biased. I sit on the UK chapter, and I genuinely believe that the UK is the key innovator in this industry. Um, we're not always first and we're not always um, the biggest. Um, I think we're the best, but that, that's contextual. But I'll tell you what, we, we are always innovating. So I think we're ahead of this curve. And I think because we've got the infrastructure in place, we've got creative agencies, but we've also got this amazing heritage of great, interesting venue stock. 
that allows us to be different from the US. It allows us to have the same sort of cutting edge as places like Germany, but with a creative center as well. Um, it allows our industry to sort of be knitted. We're, we're very well placed mm -hmm. <laughs> to be part of this industry. And I think that's why we're really accelerating through the gears here. And I think what a lot of people are doing is are looking at our industry and the way it's knitted together from an infrastructure product basis. And they're saying, wow, th 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 this is really interesting. And I think it's not a difficult thing for everyone to get in line behind that. D d uh, sorry for sort of asking you to step outside of, of your own particular venues for a mm -hmm. second, but do you think based on what Alice has just said, Richard, that there are venues out there within the UK where we have these historic venues and we're known for these wonderful old buildings um, of all sorts of shapes and sizes, are there a lot of untapped resources out there then and venues that could be um, actually utilizing themselves as really good event spaces? Within, within the UK market? Yeah. Um, I think there are obviously probably still more untapped uh, unusual venues in the market. I think though what for example uh, and you know you want to talk about other venues sure. but actually I can't really I need to talk about our venues because yeah. that's what I know. Yeah. Um, and what I'd say is that there are still unique places out there that haven't been potentially discovered but actually then poten you're are potentially in the same boat whereby that venue's not been discovered it's not set up to actually deal with events effectively. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's a big part of what we've done. Uh, which is a lot of training, a lot of development, a lot of recruiting the right people, so that yes, you can choose an unusual venue, and actually work them every day. They suddenly they're not unusual anymore to me, for example, because I talk about them every day. But someone else who's not used to going to those venues a lot, then Hatfield House is amazing. So taking what would have been considered to be an unusual venue, but giving it the infrastructure and the means to become an effective day-to-day -day event venue. Yes, exactly. And, and part of that, I, I know one of the things that, that you guys are, uh, are known for is, is, is food, mm -hmm. uh, the food element within the portfolio of events. And um, again, recently we were talking to somebody about the devil being in the detail when it comes to planning events. And obviously often people get carried away with the bigger elements of it and forget about the, the tiny little details. And whilst food may not be a, a tiny detail, often it is parked to one side and it's just taken for granted that the venue will provide some food mm. and that could be of any description how much emphasis is placed on making sure that an event organizer is is selecting the right options or or making sure that there's a level of attention paid towards that element of it well from our side of things being part of legal restaurants uk um we're really passionate about the food it's it's a really important part of our business great venues great food creating unique experiences um so whilst we really advocate that people spend more attention to food because our feedback tells us, our, our research, that 42% of, of all, all event feedback is actually about the food. So it can have a really big impact on yeah. whether people go away saying, oh, conference is okay, food was rubbish, I wouldn't go back there. And actually they associate that to the conference itself. Um, so we really think that you know, event organizers need to consider the food. Our guys on site, we, you know, we employ the, the chefs that we employ because they're passionate about delivering great food. They want to deliver a good service. They don't want to do something mediocre. So if they've got the opportunity to kind of work with a client uh, and to deliver some food that really resonates with the event they're organizing, then they're going to do that. Because in a similar way, I, see, I, I, I don't know what your opinion is on, on this, Alice, a personal opinion, but um, again, recently somebody was saying how important it is and, and how underestimated the value of, of the choosing the right music is in setting the right mood, setting the right tone, sending subconscious messages to customers at an experiential event. Yeah. And similarly, people who have great food, even if it's just some finger food, will go away and say, wow, that wasn't that great. Yeah, and, you've, and you've nailed it when you talked about the detail of it. And I think if you're gonna curate an experience, you need to look at absolutely every facet of the event as an opportunity. Now, I think it's a, it's a bit of a hangover from our past is that we create these amazing experiences or we look to create the experience and at the end we go, actually, by the way, we need to feed these guys. Mm. You have to feed them, usually, um, but it's a massive opportunity as well. So what can we say to our delegate through the food that we give them? How can we serve that food to them in a way that underlines the message of the event or makes a statement about health or care or anything like that? It's, 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 it's one of the things that it's not just about giving them a great meal, it's about sitting there going, can we make a statement as well as feed these guys? And, and, and these guys at, you know, at, at Levy and Lime Venue Portfolio are very, very well set up to get the balance right between those two things. And, and yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a massive opportunity. I think I missed one a lot, a lot of times. In this I, I, I think so, again, and this is a personal opinion, but having seen a lot of event schedules 
you know you get handed the timetable for that particular meeting or the conference or the seminars and what the program is and you see session one session two networking blah, blah, breakout, blah, blah, and then just a block lunch mm. you know it's it's just there it's just a you know a, a black hole right lunch there and it's never really seen as part of the event and c- could we be utilizing if we're allocating if an hour that's an hour missed opportunity that's isn't right it? it's, a, it's as if the event organizer switched off and then decided to switch back on after lunch when actually what they could have done is use that as a massive opportunity to do something and if it's, it's the way they they sit people down where they sit people down um, how they serve food to them what they give to them all those sort of things can they use it as a networking or even an educational experience can they can they weave it into the fabric of the mm-hmm. of the content of the event that's really exciting i think to an event organizer that's looking truly creatively and trying to create this experience that's a really big opportunity a really exciting opportunity yeah definitely there's lots of opportunity i think that's i was going to i was waiting for Ellie to finish like i could say the word opportunity yeah you know we want people to work with us we want people to come along and say i want to do maybe it differently can you do that and we'll you know bust our guts to do that for them um because we want to make sure that their event's successful and that they come back um we, as i said we're passionate about food we all love food it's a nation of foodies it's increasing all the time um, one element that you didn't mention, actually, which is quite important as well, is, is breakfast as well. We're doing quite a lot Absolutely, of work on breakfast yeah. uh, about how important that is to an event and how that can really set the tone for the event itself. Particularly on a meeting day, people are travelling from far, they've maybe skipped breakfast. That means that they can be thinking about lunch before they've even got through the morning. But if you give them some healthy breakfast options before they get to that stage, then they're going to be much more engaged with the, with the meeting or, or the event they're attending. What... Um level of attention and, and how important is it to you operationally to make sure that the staff your own staff who are interacting with delegates of a client of yours are behaving in a manner not not behaving perhaps but delivering levels of service that befit the level of attention that's gone into planning that particular event because again when we talk about people leaving an event and having a bad experience of food and going oh yeah it was a good venue and all this the, the food food was terrible People have do the same thing with service, don't they? They walk away and they say, yeah, great meeting, great mm. venue, da, da, da. but oh, I didn't like her attitude then when she served me this, that, and the other. Um, I, I mean, service is critical. It's absolutely crucial. You know, um, the UK market, I think, has, has in terms of food delivery in, in restaurants and all sorts of things, has, has learned a lot from the American market in terms of that service delivery. Um, and I believe that, you know, we've got to aim for 100%. We can't go beneath that. Uh, and if it, you know, God forbid it does go beneath that, we need to address that. But it's all about training. It's all about making sure that we actually are employing the right people in the, uh, at the right time. About employing nice people as well. I think if you employ nice people, then they deliver great service. How far off are we of, of, of actually regularly being able to create these great experiences as an, I- as an industry? You know, it's obviously something that is a continuing trend um, among venues, among organisers to... to to develop better experiences but um, there are so many facets involved in staging a meeting or a conference or a seminar or an exhibition whatever it may be how far off are we really of getting it absolutely right I think this is a trailblazing exercise I, I, I genuinely do and I, but I think I think the movement is very very strong and I think what's happening is is we're um, we're producing the goods and we're getting the chance to do it again and that's led by some, some very very creative agencies and what they'll do is they'll raise the benchmark and some other agencies will fall in behind and then you know the end buyers or the corporate uh, agencies or departments again they'll they'll be trailblazing and other companies that aren't doing it will then lock in behind and for, for, for us this is about leadership and it's about those leaders going in there and getting it right where we are at the moment is the feedbacks coming through and the feedbacks really good like really good people get it they're seeing the value on it they're able to understand what it is this industry really does for business yeah. and for people um, and they're locking in behind it so where I see this is is I feel that the tipping point is over now I think we're, we're, we're pushing in the right direction and I think what will happen is everyone will slot in neatly behind it and it will carry on going I think where, where it goes next is, is going to be quite exciting because we're going to want to evolve again as an industry. Well, well on, on that subject, I'm just looking at a, a statistic here. To, just going back to 2012, um, 20% of meetings in 2012 took place in what were classed as unusual venues, um, according to the HBAA. Um, how do we class an, an, what is an unusual venue? Are we simply saying something that is not the square hotel conference suite? 
Um, how would you class an unusual venue? It's, it's a good question. Well, I suppose you can get different answers at RCHBA on yeah, this yeah. example. Um, but for me, it's about somewhere that isn't just you know, a purpose-built location, potentially. Yeah. It's something that offers a bit more than that. Okay, something a bit more dynamic, maybe, that, yeah. that, that's going to inspire a little bit more when people pull up to it. Yeah, exa- and, and I think that, that sort of co- cookie-cutter sort of um, room that we all think mm. about that is associated, you know, with some conference centres. Yeah, w- and we should point out, not all. Absolutely, know? yeah, and, 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 and by that very specific side of things. And, and that's sort of been built around the, the need for business to be clinical, or, or business to be cool or cold, um, and that's quite an outdated view now. Um, so I think an unusual venue is something that, that that's happy to break the norm. But I also think it's for me an unusual venue you needs to be somewhere that's astounding as well, that, that that's genuinely different. I mean, unique is such a strange sort of word because mm-hmm. we yeah. all, but 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 something that that, that that is arresting in its own right as, as as you come into it. And I think the biggest people that use the word unique is the event organizer. To them, this, this, this building over here is unique to, to people that have been doing it all their lives, perhaps not. But if they think it's unique, brilliant. Let's go mm. for it, let's do that. If they think it's unusual and it's made a statement, brilliant, let's go for that. Because any venue could be unique, it could be uniquely terrible. It <laughs> yeah. doesn't necessarily have to, just because well, it's unique, doesn't necessarily make it a good venue. Yes, l- luckily, and less I, of I'm them I'm interested, these days. When, we, when we talk about unusual venues, I think it's a bit of a strange term really to use because of the fact that the industry is is branching out so broadly into looking at different locations for its events um, and identifying new ways to to interact with people. And I think ultimately, uh, again, this is this is opinion. I don't know what your thoughts on are, but ultimately, long term, what we would hope is that this drive to search for unusual quote unquote venues will actually then boost the traditional venues to actually improve what they're doing, to to actually refine and reevaluate what the traditional conference room should look like. As a venue, I think in, in, in my mind, it's about looking at that th- there is a movement here of creating very special events that are very memorable and that take place in uh, arresting and interesting settings and that achieve a very specific thing. For me, that's the future of the industry. There is still a need and a demand for other things, and, and, and there's probably a place for that as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the future, but there is a place for it. And I think it's important that we kind of segment the bit that's that's driving the growth in the events industry, which for me, in a venue perspective, it is this sort of unusual, um, new, interesting spaces, um, and that's growing, uh, d- d- driving the quality of the industry, which is this this move towards experience rather than straight events. Um, that's the sector I think that we should be looking at as the leadership part. We, we, we also need to understand that there are other things going on and, and then there's people that have their place and that are having very good experiences and, and, and all that in the meantime. But I think for, for people that care about the leadership and the future of the industry, this is the bit that I think we're most excited about. If I could just ask Richard, are there any aspects of your portfolio of venues uh, that um, are non-fixed in terms of areas that people can create temporary venues? Yeah, definitely. So, so we're not talking purely about fixed buildings here because I'm curious to know what what development there has been and what trend there has been towards people not just looking at an unusual fixed venue but actually looking at a space and thinking what can I do with that outdoor space with a temporary venue? Well a lot of our venues have outdoor space uh, and therefore temporary venues can be can be erected then. Um, what we find as well is quite a few of our venues can be used with all the different spaces combined. Mm-hmm. So you have a venue like Bewley on the south coast uh, which has got historic domus but it's also got the National Motor Bay Motor Motor Car Museum. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and outdoor space in between all those areas. Uh, and, and what we get quite a lot of is people looking to utilise all the spaces, um, particularly for family days and those kind of things. And how difficult is it to actually then, when somebody wants to utilise all of those spaces, we're then into the realms of looking at what the audience demographic is going to be, how those people are going to move around. And this all comes back to understanding your venue in as much detail as possible, doesn't it? Because if somebody comes to you and says, look, I've got an event that's sizable enough to utilize all of your spaces what's the best way to actually here are my elements what's the best way to deploy them you need to be come back to them with a, a very sort of clear answer to that don't you and be able to yeah, understand definitely. what they need um, uh, how much work is done on prior to actually identifying and and, and finalizing a client and finalize a venue uh, you know how important is it to actually spend some time understanding what they need and actually establishing whether or not you can even cater for that I think I think at the forefront of this movement, this this sort of trend, is, is, is it starts with the content. Mm-hmm. What are we trying to say? What's our creative angle on that? How are we going to deliver that? 
I think what then happens is how do we deliver it through a partnership with the venue or a partner with the caterer or whoever we want to do it, but then it becomes a partnership. And between those people, we can sit there and sort of say, how can we segment this content? How can we could deliver a nuanced message to one person and not the other? How can we move that delicate experience into different areas physically uh, as, as, as well as um, you know, from a wider perspective? How can that venue contribute? by its formats, its buildings, its locations, its her history, its heritage, its expertise within the buildings and things like that as well, just to sort of move that through. And then what happens that's really exciting is that partnership sort of moves the um, the event content organically. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens is that it, it speeds up and it becomes more interesting. And then it starts looking at theming and then it starts looking at um, design and things like that. Um, and then it starts coming outside of those rooms in terms of uh, pre-promotion, simple things like invites, as well as follow-ups, return visits, you sure, know, returns yeah. to, and all that. That's that that that's how I think that partnership works really really well for that aspect. As we draw this episode to to, to a conclusion, when, when we talk about a move and a trend towards experience, where do we see the um, the future of this trend? Where where is it all going? Well, we believe it's going to continue to grow, basically. Uh, that it's going to continue to grow and we get, we're going to want to be at the forefront of encouraging people to do that to making sure that you know people are thinking about the, as Ali said the whole event from the start to the finish this, um, this particular episode dovetails very nicely with, um, with the previous episode um, of, the, uh, of the Talk and Events podcast and I think there's cer certainly scope for people to listen um, listen to them back to back and we'll, we'll, we'll make efforts to make sure that we link those two together because there are some things that we've discussed today that as I said we, we've highlighted in recent episodes um, and I think again it's, it's like every episode that we do there's an ongoing discussion and other ways that we can link it together and what we'd like listeners to do is either get in touch through Twitter at Talking Events we will also tweet links out to the respective Twitter handles of the guests in the studio today so that if you've got any questions for them you can put questions to them directly or get in touch with them if you want to find out any further information. Um, it leaves me to round up by thanking our guests today uh, Alistair Turner from 8PR thank you for joining us Richard Cadry Langford from Lime Venue Portfolio. Richard, thanks for joining Talking nice Events. You. Um, you can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, uh, search for uh, Talking Events. You can subscribe via the Event Industry News YouTube channel if you wish to watch the, uh, the podcast. And you can also view it via the Event Industry News website. But for now, you have been listening to Talking Events. Mm -hmm.